And according to my research, or according to this, you are in the room for Infrastructure as Code. Uh, welcome to my session. My name is Mike Bankovich, and um, this is all about how do we go out and build and deploy stuff into the, the different clouds or use automation to be able to go out and, and run things. Um, it does come from a Microsoft-ish kind of a focus, so it's, you know, what do I use for Azure primarily, but, you, but Terraform runs with a lot of different things. And uh, Pulumi, though, is cross-platform, and there's a whole bunch of different things. So uh, thank you for coming to my session. And we'll see you guys later. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so what do you guys want to get out of today? Why are you here? Anyone? Pros and cons? Pros and cons? Okay. Okay. I know it is. Right. Okay. Have you used both? Okay. So. So you're curious, what's the difference between them? How do they work? Which one's better? Yeah, it's kind of the comparison. Right. Okay. How many people use something for infrastructure's code already? And, and keep your hands up if it's, if it's Terraform, but put your hand down if it's not. That's about half the room. So the other people are using, uh, put your hands up if it's, say, uh, ARM or BICEP. That's, Probably, if you're Azure, that's a lot that people do. Anyone doing Pulumi or Ansible? Anyone using something called Azure CLI? Anyone deploy anything using the, you know, the, the how about the portal? You can click around on things in the portal. Infrastructure as code, that's not, that's not infrastructure as code, that's called infrastructure as chaos. And as much as I like infrastructure as chaos, I don't know that that's where we wanna go. Um, give you guys some background, um, I'm, I'm a former Microsoft, uh, evangelist, I helped launch a lot of the Visual Studio products. I'm a tools kind of a person. My focus is around how can I be more productive? What can I use to make my life easier? And I look at these infrastructure as code things kind of from that lens of what does the tooling look like? How mature is it? And how far is it going to be able to take me? Um, if you want to connect with me, I am on LinkedIn Learning. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn also. If you scan that barcode, we'll be friends. Um, and I'd love to hear from you because I, I do answer the IM, the messaging on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have questions or anything like that, I run a, a thing called Azure Office Hours every Friday. It's 15 minutes of anything Azure you want to talk about. I, may, I, I don't know the answers to a lot of stuff, but if I do, I'd be happy to share them. Or I might know some people, um, help direct you to somewhere where you can get answers for whatever your questions are. Um, I'm interested in your feedback. This is a session I've done a couple times, but I'm interested to know what we can do to improve it. So um, at the end of the session, there's gonna be uh, some cards outside. I think everyone is aware that there's things where you can say, if you enjoyed the session, just drop one of those green cards. If it's red, you just give that to me directly. So um, just kind of work from there. So what is it we're gonna do? I want to kind of share and stand up some infrastructure's code side by side and show you how we would use it in different scenarios do things like create a service, create some configuration, show you what the tooling looks like. Um, we'll do some hello to kind of, you know, like hello world is basic things. And then we'll talk about considerations and also questions. You know, how does this fit? How does that go with this or whatever? Stop me and let me know, you know, what we can do to, to, to do that. So I went out to chat GPT. I said, well, if you were to do an infrastructure as code talk, what kinds of things would you talk about? He's like, oh, Efficiency, scalability, and he actually, the uh, AI had a lot of interesting things, and I'm like, I already had that in my slides, but I thought I would just, you know, disclaimer, um, you know, AI is, is interesting, and it's gonna be interesting to see how it all fits into where we're going with the world. But to start with an application, an application is an idea. An idea that takes some data and somehow puts some code to it, runs it on some infrastructure and then, you know, and then it's something real. But until it's running, you, know, you need that infrastructure. Um, a cloud application runs in a data center. It's got you know, some different characteristics. It's virtualized hardware as opposed to real hardware or you know, physical. It's usually, I wanna be able to go out and provision things. I wanna be able to monitor it. I wanna be able to configuration. I wanna scale. Um, there's a lot of different things that we, we, we go into. 
And what I have got is I want to do a demo today, but I really wanted to, let's do this. Do you guys like to see code, like real code? Hands on, live demos? Okay. And if it crashes and goes boom, then it's like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Look at this. I'm going to create a project. I'm going to call it Make Durham. I'm calling it NDC23. We'll change directory there, NDC23 dot net new razor, and then we'll put our output to, uh, we'll call it NDC web. Yeah, interesting. So did it do something? Code, period. So I'm gonna use VS Code. Uh, how many people use Visual Studio Code for writing code? About half, and Visual Studio, about the other half. If you are interested in how this works, we could use both today. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a git init to uh, create a, you know, something so we can actually see what we're changing and whatever. Uh, we'll do a .NET new solution. And with that solution, uh, I'll add our project. SLN add, and we'll call it NDC web. So, I now have a solution file, you see it's right there, and I can go .NET, or I can go dev environment, D-E-V-E-N-V, and then ndc23.sln. Just like that, now we're running, and we've got code, and we've got something out here we're gonna be able to work with and play around, build something useful. Um, I like to build web apps. Web apps are kind of nice because in the cloud, I can go out and deploy them and see how they're going to work. So if I go out, let's go back over to VS Code. Here's my NDC web. If I go into my pages, go to my index page. Can you see the screen, by the way? Is that big enough? I can make it a little bit bigger. Just like that. At using Microsoft. Dot extensions, dot configuration, and I'm going to use injection. I'm going to inject at I configuration, and we'll call it config. And with that configuration, I can come over here and I can say, welcome to something interesting, like I'll put this at config, and we're gonna use the environment name. Quote, ENV, ENV name. And if I was to take this project and run it, I would have an application that's reading from some configuration to go out and tell me where I'm running and doing stuff. I might have a joke in here, like a dad joke, where I'm going to go out and add a little bit of code. And by the way, I don't know if you've noticed, there's a whole lot of stuff popping up on the screen. When I talk about tooling, one of the things that I've turned on is called GitHub Copilot. And GitHub Copilot is a little bit, kind of an interesting little thing in that it will recommend or suggest code that I might want to do based on code that I've written in the past and billions of lines of code that it's looked at. So, and it's 80 to 90% accurate, which means I need to look closely to see what it's actually suggesting I go do. Anyway, in here, I'm gonna use a at config, and I'm gonna pull in my favorite color. And let's call this favorite color. And if I'm over in Visual Studio, and I open up the page, here's my environment name, here's my favorite color. I can go to my app settings, and I can add to my settings a value for my environment name. ENV name, and I'm gonna call this, quote, local, and it renamed it Kestrel, that's interesting. It's not as intelligent as I'd like it to be, ENV name. And what's our favorite color?
Anyone have a favorite color? Red? No, blue. Ah. How about light blue? If I were to take this and run it, what I have is I have an application. And let it go out and do its building, build succeed. Starts up the application. And now you can see that here's my application. Here's my idea. I want to write something called the dad app. And so what it's got is it's got the environment where it's running. There's the local. And it's all written in .NET Core. It's all kind of cool. If I refresh the page, the reason I wrote this app was that I've got two daughters. They graduated from high school and from college, and I can't always be there, so I wanted to create something for that fatherly wisdom. And I call this the dad app, right? So every time they go out, they can say, ah, yeah, hey, dad. Um, so what I want to do is I want to take this and turn it into something that they can get to. And so to do that, what I need to do is I need to deploy this somewhere. So I'm going to put it into Azure because Azure happens to be a public cloud that is easy to use. I can go out to Azure. I can go out and I can create a resource group. I could create a website. And then I could go out and do my deployment to it. OK, well, that's clicking around in the portal. We don't want to do that. But we could also deploy this by going into Visual Studio, right click and say deploy, go to publish, tell it where we want to go. If we go into Azure, click on Next. We'll use a uh, app service, Windows or Linux. We could do containers. We could do a bunch of different things. But I can go through and I can pick out and describe how I want this to go. Um, I'm going to create a new app service. So I'll click on Create New. It would go out and give me you know, the whole thing I need. And I can export out of this a template that I could save, which is an ARM template describing what that infrastructure looks like. And this is one way I can go out and I can create infrastructure as code. I could use that later on to go out and deploy things. One of the things I will suggest about this is it is easy, but it may not be what you want to do. Um, there are other ways that we can go out and do that. Um, and that's really what this talk is, is how do we make it something so that we can repeat it? You know, so that it's not trying to give the, the operations people, here's a map of things to click on to deploy the application. Don't want to do that. What we want to do is provide something that's got a little bit more structure to it. And so with that, you know, we talk about what kinds of tools do we use and what's available to us. The ARM template that it created, that's great. Azure Resource Manager is how Azure uh, manages things that are created. But there are other tools that are out there. And you have to ask a, a number of different questions to decide which one's right for you. I want to kind of talk about um, Azure. So I'm looking at really the uh, first party things, which are going to be ARM. It's going to be the CLI. It's going to be BICEP. Um, if I'm doing things that are cross cloud, maybe I might have stuff on premises. Other tools like Terraform. Uh, which is a pretty, pretty solid uh, option. A lot of people are using it already. Pulumi, which is sort of a wrapper for Terraform. Under the hood, it's actually generating the Terraform. Um, there's Ansible, which is another way to go out and create things that we can create workflows to go out and provision stuff, um, as well as other tools. Uh, infrastructure as code has the benefits of being versioned. It has the advantages of being descriptive as opposed to procedural. I describe what the shape of the infrastructure I want to create is going to look like, and it will then figure out how to get the infrastructure moved into that when I go out and do a deployment. Um, and it helps me you know, look at things like uh, the environment drift. You know, how are things kind of not lined up the way that they should? So with that, um, the first one is really talking about ARM. And ARM is Azure Resource Manager, which is the native way that Azure keeps track of what's been provisioned. And so ARM is um, it's a JSON, JavaScript object notation-based language that describes out a series of calls to the APIs and the services to go out and do provisioning and creation of things uh, inside of the cloud. Um, each resource is translated into REST call. And to be able to go out and create that, I can either, like I said, go into the portal, provision some stuff. I can go into Visual Studio and export a template. But I can also just look at the portal and be able to see stuff that's been deployed. So for instance, if I were to go out here 
and take a look at my VSL demos, you'll see that down here I have a AKS, I've got a, a container registry and some other things. If I look at the deployments section, I can see all the deployments that have happened on that resource group. And the nice thing about this is that I can go back and say, oh yeah, well, what was this web deployment? And I can go and I can see this and I can actually open up the template and I can see here's the template that it used to create this. Everything down to the variables, the site publishing, uh, properties. The challenge is that this is JSON and I have to be able to understand how to go out and create and work with that. Now creating an ARM template from scratch, if you've never done it before, um, there are some tools that make that easier. If you're a Visual Studio developer, one of the nice things that they introduced a, a few years ago was a resource group project type. So if I were to go and add a new project to this, and I go out and I search for, search the templates for a resource, you'll see it's gonna go back and it's gonna pull back the two uh, resource group project types. And since it's kind of running slow, it is right here, but if I go out and type this, you see it's got C-sharp and Visual Basic. It doesn't really make a difference because it's not either. It's JSON and uh, PowerShell. But I can create a deployment for this. So I'm gonna call this VS, and I'm going to put this into an infra folder and click on Create. Now the resource group project type lets me start with a blank template or I can pick some common infrastructure that might map out to what I'm gonna be building. A lot of times you have a database, you might have some other things. And so you can see I've got a service fabric cluster, I've got virtual machine scale sets, I've got SQL apps. Um, if I don't see what I want here, I can click on the other, I can go to the quick start templates and this then goes out and pulls back thousands upon thousands of existing ARM templates I could use as a starting place. So maybe I need a virtual machine that has a firewall, Palo Alto, that has a certain kind of configuration. If this had worked, then you would be able to see that. But since it didn't, we're just gonna skip over that part because that's not really the important thing here. The important thing is that you can you know, start, have a starting place for this. Um, I'm gonna start with a simple web application and say okay. And what this does is it creates a project type for me um, that has three main things. It's got a ARM template called website.json. It's got a parameters file, which I can use for that to be able to keep track of the parameters I'm gonna deploy. And then it's got a PowerShell script to go out and actually run this. And the nice thing about this is if I open up the, the template, you can see I've got the, uh, the values already populated here. It's a little bit cumbersome. So if you are in Visual Studio, I highly recommend going to the JSON outliner which has been available for a little while, but what it does is it gives you a nice graphical way to look at the parameters, variables, resources, and other parts of the template. And so a quick way to navigate this is I can go out and say, here's my resources, here's my website, and I can navigate right to it. Um, one of the nice things about the JSON outliner is I can right click and add other things to this. So for instance, if I want to, I can add a resource, for instance, for uh, app configuration for the settings. We'll call this config. And I can say add. Um, understanding how the schema looks when you're doing infrastructure or using, using ARM, um, you have a, a number of different areas of this schema. And if you use the outline, you can kind of collapse this down. So you can say here's variables, here's resources. And you'll see that it's just a simple format that is really you know, parameters, variables, and resources. If I look at my parameters, I can add more detail around different things. It looks like hosting plan name, the SKU name. Um, I have options for things I might want to be able to go out and deploy. For our purposes, I'm going to allow the use of the F1 and maybe the S1 is the only two options. I can set default values. So the default value for the SKU name is going to be an F1. Where these come into play is if I go out and do a deployment from Visual Studio, if I right click and say deploy, create a new one, log in, I need to pick my subscription to be my dev dad sandbox, pick the resource group we're gonna to go to. We're gonna create a new resource group, I'm gonna call this my NDC arm, and I'm gonna put this in West Europe. 
not Japan East, but West Europe. And we'll call this my NDC ARM RG. Click on Create. And then I can go out and get into the parameters, and I can edit the parameters. And if you look at the, the parameters, like the dropdown, now it has just those F1 and S1. Um, one of the nice things about this is that as I add other resources to the template as I'm working with it, um, I can go and I can add something like, suppose we're going to use a database in here. So let's add a SQL database. If I do a search for SQL, there's my SQL database. We'll call this my demo DB. Here's my SQL server. We'll create a new one. I'm going to call this my NDC 23 DBMS. Click on add. And then I can say, okay, here's this. And if, on the left-hand side, you'll see that highlighted in, in bold the new additional parameters it added, uh, all of the new things. So I can very quickly and visually see what's different, what's new about this. Um, one of the no other nice things that I can do is if I take a look at this, so here's my parameters file. If I right-click and I do a deployment, and I go to the sandbox, and we're going to the NDC ARM resource group, and I click on parameters, you'll see, you'll see the parameters now has the additional parameters that it added. So it's, it's nice because I can go out in here and say, here's my NDC 23 plan. I can say, here's my SQL login, SQL admin. Actually, with SQL Server, we use SA and a blank password, right? Is anyone not old enough to remember that joke? Anyway. Um, but here's the password. We can put the password in here. I can type it in. And then I can just save it as clear text so I can check it into GitHub. No? All right. Well, you'll see on, on this one over here on the right, you'll see I've got a little lock. This is actually kind of a cool little thing. I can click on this. And I can say, here's, I want to use a key vault. And so I either have a key vault that I created that's shared for my organization, and I can uh, use that to do the deployment, or I could switch to a different subscription. But the nice thing about this is it allows me to use my key vault to be able to store those secrets so that I never actually have to let the developer actually see it. So if I were to go out here and say create a new uh, NDC secret password, we'll create new. We're going to put the secret name NDC password. And then we'll put in a value. And if I type it right the same, or tw type it the same way twice, then it should save it. And if I can't type it right, then it's going to do that. Uh, but we'll cancel that. And I'm just going to use my secret password that I had created before. So there's my SQL password. Click OK. And it's going to save this in the key vault. And then I can use that. And then we go demo DB, click on save. And you'll look back here. It actually used the resource to map out to the key vault and then whatever the secret name is. So then during deployment, it's already added the, uh, the ability for my deployment to pull that in at runtime. So if I click on deploy, it's going to go out and say, OK, create the different things. And now it's going to run a PowerShell script in the back end that will go and take that parameter and pass it out or run it out there. Any questions about the Visual Studio tools for ARM? Does everyone feel like they understand how ARM works now? <laughs> it, it just made so much sense. And I'm like, no. You, you, you clicked on some things and a bunch of JSON showed up. And it's like, yeah, I don't understand that. What I found is that Talking with the Microsoft team that owns this, they, they've invested heavily in VS Code for the future of their tooling around ARM templates. And while this is one way to do this, I personally find that ARM is so much easier when I start with VS Code. And to show you what that looks like, I'm going to leave this and let it go. I'm going to go into VS Code. And what I'm going to do is, if I look at my infra folder, I'm going to create a new folder in here. So I'm on this. I'm going to create a folder. I'm going to call this just ARM. And I'm going to create a file. 
and we call this my site dot json. And if I go arm and I tab, it's going to go out and it's going to give me a format that is just that arm template. And so what the arm template looks like, if I zoom in here, is you have parameters, functions, variables, resources, and outputs. And these are each a different section of different kinds of things that I can work with when I'm working with ARM. Um, the idea of being able to go out and create a, um, a schema that's going to have a couple parameters. Um, one of the challenges of working with infrastructure's code is enforcing things that are governance related, like naming standards. Like, how do you name things? Is name, naming is important. I, I'm just making out a blanket statement. I'm assuming everyone agrees with me. If you don't, does anyone not agree about names? I use a GUID. For, anyone use GUIDs for names? Please, no. Um, the nice thing about uh, working with something like this is I can use a pattern for being able to go out and create and manage names. So for instance, if I'm in here and I'm using my parameters, I could have a uh, parameter. If I go like this, it says new parameter, yay, and it gives me all the JSON that would look like what that parameter looked like. So I could put in here my app name. And it's a string, and there's a description, and I could add other things to this, like I could add a default value, I could have allowed values, I can have, you know, the, the, the data type could be a Boolean, it could be an integer. Um, the nice thing about this is that when I'm going out and doing that, I don't have to use that very verbose way of doing it. Um, and in fact, I tend not to. Um, I've got my own uh, kind of parameter, which is just one line. I find this to be a little bit easier to read. So if it, like environment name, you know, this is gonna be arm, and I might have another one for env name. And I might have something for location or color. And then I can come down to the variables and I can create things that I might use uh, to enforce my naming standards. So I like to do a thing where I've got a variable called prefix. And my prefix is usually going to be taking advantage of some uh, functions like a concat of the parameters of the app name and the environment name. Oh, by the way, this is uh, GitHub Copilot suggesting things. And this is the first time I've used GitHub Copilot when I'm up here trying to type stuff in. So if it seems a little bit disjointed, it's because I'm learning, I'm seeing it for the first time too. Well, not really, but sort of. Um, so let's have our uh, host name is going to be similar and it's gonna concatenate the name of the variables. Let's take this out. variables of my prefix, and I'm going to do a dash plan, and then I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna have another one, and we're gonna call this my site name. And concat variables prefix slash site. That looks about right. And then I'm gonna come over here to my resources, and I'm going to have some resources that I'm gonna create. One is going to be a hosting plan where I'm gonna run this stuff from, so I'm gonna say my Linux, my Linux plan. Okay. This is where we go to extensions, <laughs> copilot, and we're going to shut you off. I'm sorry. And then I'm going to reload. There, sorry. All right, my, ooh, that's not good. Um, but what I would do is I would go through and I would then add in um, a hosting plan where I'm gonna run my site from, and then I would add whatever kinds of things I need to do with it, like the configuration and other, other pieces of that. Um, one of the things about the tooling for uh, 
working with ARM templates inside of v VS Code is that uh, it does take a little bit of time to load up what that ARM schema looks like for the extension that is, is built into um, the ARM extension for, for VS Code. Um, and if you don't wait for that to finish, then it looks really funny because you're starting to type and you're expecting things to happen and they don't. Um, but the extension that I'm using here for ARM is going to be the uh, Microsoft uh, Azure Resource Manager, um, just a straight, basic thing. Um, come back over here to this, and let's go here. So, and loading ARM schemas is still clicking through. Um, questions about ARM before I, while well, this is loading? So, the, so it's a good question. Does VS Code have that same graphic JSON outline that you do, and can I right click and add stuff? And the answer is no. It, it, at least I haven't found a way to make that work, and they may have changed it since I last looked at it. Um, but where I was able to go out and say, okay, insert my configuration, and show me my SQL server, and things like that. It does, however, have IntelliSense for all of those things, and so I can use code snippets to be able to go and do those same kinds of things. So, like, for instance, if I'm right here and I type in plan, you'll see it comes up with an ARM plan. And this is the built-in snippet from, uh, from, Visual, or from VS Code. And so I could use this, and I could say, here's my app service plan, and I could put the display name, and instead of having that, I can go, here's my variables, and I'm using my host name, and I could do it like that. Um, now, I have kind of done this with... Um, with my own snippets, so when I type in my, I've got some snippets I created out here, and I've got a Linux plan, and I'm gonna use Linux because I find .NET Core running on Linux is faster, cooler, it's the new hip thing, I can put it on my LinkedIn profile, it says I'm a Linux developer, it's pretty awesome. Um, so let's use my variables for my host name, and then I'm going to have a Linux site and the Linux site is going to have um, a couple of other uh, pieces. So the first is gonna be, you know, what's the site name? And I have a variable for that. So we'll put in our variables for my site name. And then over here, I've got the host name. And one of the nice things I like about Visual Studio or VS Code is that I can have multi-carat editing and it's like I'm editing in multiple places at once. It's a nice little feature, because um, I can go to variables here and pull in my uh, host name, and then I can tab down to the next thing and be able to work with this. And then we'll add some resources, and here I'm gonna put in my parameters. Oops, not that one. My configuration. And this then has the app configuration for the uh, site name, which is gonna come from variables of my site name. And then I'm gonna put down here my ENV name is gonna be ARM, and then my favorite color. And I can put in light pink or whatever I want. I could also do a parameter for that. But the thing is, is that with this, I can then go out and I can edit and work with the template. And it's, I, th I find this to be a little bit easier to understand how ARM works when you've been actually diving into creating it from scratch. And the, temp the tooling for this is really, really good. I find. So if I do a save on this, and I take a look at it, you'll see over here I've got a little red mark. That tells me that I probably have a syntax error. It looks like I do. I've got an extra comma, and notice the little red squiggly goes away. And that's one of the things about VS Code and the tooling that is really nice is that the IntelliSense is, is really rich. Um, you don't get that in, v in Visual Studio's uh, resource group project type. Um, let's go ahead and save everything. I'm gonna go over here and I'm going to add a file at the infra level. I'm gonna call this my test it, test iac.ps1. And I'm going to write a little script to test this. So I wanna be able to go out and do the deployment. Where Visual Studio had a PowerShell script to go out and do the deployment, I'm gonna do something similar, but I've, I wanna be able to test my IAC. 
and it's not coming up. Okay. So I'm going to go to this and figure out why that didn't come in. Copy that. So what I've got, and if you go out to my GitHub, you'll find a script that looks a lot like this that is going to be basically going through and doing a deployment test of, uh, of what, we're, what we're creating here. So I do an Azure login. I set my account. I set my app name. We're going to call this NDC23. We'll create a resource group using that. And then I run an AZ group create. So let's do this. Do an F8. That sets those variables for me. I can create the resource group if it's not already created. Again, an F8 inside of the uh, terminal lets me run the PowerShell script, the integrated ID PowerShell script. Um, this will go out and create my resource group, and then I can go out and do a deployment using the AZ deployment create, group create, uh, passing in the resource group, and then the place where the site lives. So if I do an F8 on this, and I've got some parameters out here that I'm passing in also to tell it you know, what are the parameters I'm passing in. I could also do a uh, parameter file and have all the values stored in there as well. Um, but if I go out and I do this, if I've typed in things correctly, um, it's going to go out and it will then try to do that deployment. I didn't tell it the environment name, so I'm going to have to do that, env. We'll call this arm, color, light, blue. And then it's going to go ahead and, and do that deployment. So then down on the bottom, what you'll see is the little running thing telling me what it's, what's going on. And it'll then do the deployment and push this out into, uh, into Azure for me. Any questions about arm at this point? It, so uh, there are there are extensions I can get for the key vaults that would allow me to uh, string together what that would look like. But I can also just put in, when I'm using a key vault, I have a URL for where that key vault lives and also the name of the secret. And if I put that into the parameter file, it would then be able to go out and do that. Um, one of the things when I'm doing the deployment is I do have to authorize whoever is doing the deployment, the, the uh, service principal, the identity of the thing running it. And if I'm running this in a CD, type of a pipeline, I would have to enable that to work with that particular key vault. Key vaults then lock down to that identity level. Good question. Any other questions? Um, we'll let that finish. Um, the ARM structure is, is, like I said, it's a basic JSON structure that has your parameters, variables, resources. Uh, when you create a resource, it's generally going to have a format where you've got a name, you've got a type, those are required. You have an API version, that's required. If you deploy something, there's a, they version these APIs frequently, so you need to put in something that, that has whatever level of API you're using, and then it'll work to uh, go out and do the deployment. And then there's a bunch of other optional parameters that would be added depending on the resource type that you're deploying. Um, Tools, VS Visual Studio, the resource group project type, I find to be a, a that's how I started working with it. Uh, VS Code, the ARM extension, really, really nice. I think GitHub Copilot's gonna be interesting to see how that works out over time and get more used to how it's doing things. Um, but it's native to Azure. It's 100% uh, up with anything you can deploy in Azure is deployed through ARM. That's the, the way that Microsoft adds services is using their own tools. Um, but the problem is that it's somewhat verbose. It, it, it can get very wordy. It's hard to read. You have a lot of things that are duplicate that maybe could be done better. And for that reason, Microsoft has a project called Project Bicep, which, and I said, you know, animates ARM, whatever. They were, they, they called it different things and they weren't sure if they should call it ARM or bicep, but they ended up with that. Uh, but it's a transpiler. And what that means is it takes a file and generates JSON and ARM out of it. 
that it uses to do things. In fact, I can take an ARM template and I can decompile it into BICEP and it will give me that to start with, um, which is really nice. The syntax for it, if you're a Terraform developer, looks very similar to what you're used to in Terraform. I've got variables, I've got the ability to work with, you know, in Terraform I have locals, I have some different things. I can go out and I can basically describe how that all comes together. Modular, I can create a module, it's just a BICEP file that I can then import and use uh, wherever I need to. It is free, it's uh, open source. Um, I don't have to worry about state management because it's using that ARM, that resource uh, manager uh, backend is, is for what it, it's doing. Um, the nice thing about this is if I look at my files here, and we go ahead and collapse the VS one, and I come over to this, and let's make this a little bit bigger, is I can go uh, and I can decompile the, uh, the application. I'm gonna do this right here, and just considering on how much real estate do I need, I can do uh, AZ Bicep decompile, and then pass in the file name, and I'm gonna use mysite.json. So if I do this line, um, what it's gonna do is it's gonna go out and it's gonna take that and it's gonna decompile it. It's going to create some warnings which I found kind of interesting because it's like the location. Uh, you're not supposed to do locations this way. And I'm like, so I reached out to Microsoft and said, hey guys, your ARM template that you gave me has warnings when I go decompile it into BICEP. He's like, well, that's so that you know what's going on. I'm like, fine, I'll work with it. Um, to look at what BICEP looks like, I'm gonna, give us some more real estate here. You'll see that this is a whole lot more readable. Um, there's my description for app name. There's my parameters. I have a parameter for color. I'm not using it anywhere, but I defined it some, somehow. I've got a, a prefix um, where I'm specifying variables and I'm using a syntax where I'm using dollar and then whatever that uh, parameter or variable name is and it's able to figure out. So then I've got my naming standard. So my host name is gonna be this plan, this site. Um, when I go out and create resources, it's gonna go through and it's telling me, hey, you know, this is something you shouldn't be doing. It's a warning. It's probably gonna get taken away at some point to become you know, dead technology. You'll have to deal with it. Um, but this is nice if you've got an existing template. I can go out into the, into the portal and I can download that template that is whatever infrastructure I've got and I can decompile that into BICEP. And I can use that as my starting place for things I'm going to make. So for instance, this is, now, this is deploying right now in what's called the resource group scope. So when I deploy it, it's deploying this into a resource group. With BICEP, I can deploy at the management group, subscription level, resource group. There's a bunch of different levels that I can go out and do deployments, which is actually kind of nice because I might want to be able to create the resource group as we're doing this. So the way that you would do that is by creating a BICEP file just from scratch. So like main.bicep would be like this, where I've got my target scope. And we'll set our target scope at the subscription level. And then I wanna go out and I wanna create something. So let's do a resource here, we'll call it RG. And it's going to be a resource group. Notice the IntelliSense is really good about figuring out what I was going to type. And then I have the schema versions, which is, again, just by itself, this is almost worth going to BICEP, just because now it's like I don't have to be guessing, oh, well, which version do I need to do? And I can say equals, and I can have required properties to tell me where I'm gonna put this. So then it says, here's my name and my location. I will go ahead and create a var, or a parameter for string, or uh, app name is a string, and I'll have a parameter which would be my environment name, string, default, bicep. And then we have a variable, our G name is equal to dollar, and we'll use our app name, dash dollar env name, dash RG, and then we'll come down here and use our G name. And then we'll use our location. I can just hard code this to be uh, west,
put this into a hard-coded thing. Probably shouldn't do this, but oh well. Um, so then from here, then I can go out and I can use modules. In Terraform, I've got modules where I can point to a source. In Bicept, I can use a module by simply going out and saying module and call this my site, and then pick the file that I want to pull from. Didn't used to allow me to do uh, ARM templates, but it does now, and it behaves almost identical because it's beyond, underneath the scene, under the covers, it's the same thing. Um, so here's my, bi my bicep, and I have the required properties. And notice that it went through and figured out all the properties that I had in that template, in that bicep file, and it automatically fills them in. So we'll put this into the scope of the RG. The name of this is going to be my site deployment, NDC site. And then I'm going to use my app name. I'm going to have my color, uh, light pink, and then my environment name. And what this will do then is it will go out and call whatever those other templates are. But Bicep makes it a lot easier to understand and to work with some of these complex infrastructures. Uh, the way we do a deployment on this is we would go out and do the same kind of a deployment um, where we do a deployment to the West Europe Resource Group and we pass in that value for that BICEP file. And we're doing this deployment at the subscription level. So then this would go out and if I do a control this, like this, it's going to go out. It's going to say, hey, what's your app name? MDC23. And then it has all the values it needs for everything else. So now it's going to go through. And it takes that bicep, compiles it into ARM, and then runs that ARM deployment um, at the subscription level. Questions? Can you download the bicep template from the portal? Can I download the bicep template from the portal? Yeah, the no. It'll give me the ARM template that the BICEP compiles into, and then I can decompile that. But if it compiles directly into the BICEP, why can't they use it? The BICEP doesn't exist inside of Azure. It's a tool to create ARM. And so what, what uh, the Azure portal is doing is it's actually using that ARM template. So what's happening is that my machine is taking the BICEP and generating an ARM template, and then it's using that ARM template to do the deployment into Azure. It, 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 it is compatible in that I can decompile that ARM template back into the bicep, that, the original bicep that it was. But it doesn't represent it inside the portal as bicep. The representation within the Azure portal is going to be ARM. And the reason why is that inside of Azure, if I go over to the, uh, like a browser, and I click over here and I go resources.azure.com, this is, this is my actual Azure resources, the database, or the, you know, the data store that has this, um, I can go and I can click on my subscriptions. I can click through here, and you'll see that this is the actual resources that are out here. So if I go out and I see here's my resource group, here's the one we just created for BICEP, and I can see inside of this the resources that got created. And it's actually, so when I go to the portal, it's actually pulling this back out for me. Good question, though. Yeah. It's 100% compatible with ARM. It's 100% up to date with Azure. It's always going to be always accurate, always on. Good question. Yes? Mark, one more thing here. The documentation of ISEP won't be But sometimes the variables that it will document to you right. are not necessarily for the ARM template. You have to do a set of tools. Right. That's very important. And you've run into that, and yeah. yeah. Um, for the interest of time, um, I'm going to move on to Terraform. I'm going to just do a quick summary of this and then move on because I want to make sure that we uh, give, give time to everything. And then I'm going to be around after this. If you have questions or whatever, by all means, I'm going to be uh, sticking around. The idea of BICEP is you have a target scope, you have parameters, variables, resources, modules, and outputs. Um, the uh, parameters, you can have allowed values, descriptions. The annotations allow you to d decorate how you want the parameters to work. Um, 
when you create variables, you can uh, use the syntax. Uh, you've got the resources. Um, go out and get started with it. The next one is Terraform. Terraform is another infrastructure as code. It's been around for a while. And what it does is it's a way that I can use, uh, created by HashiCorp, what's called HCL, HashiCorp language, which is a, the syntax for how I go out and describe resources inside of, uh, inside of whatever cloud. It is cross-cloud. It is not just cloud. I can use it to provision things like, for instance, I've got Datadog, which I use for monitoring. And I can create Datadog uh, test cases in Terraform and provision them on on-premise machines. Um, I can use it for a lot of different things. And if I want to create something, I can actually write a provider for Terraform to animate and automate how that works. Um, the way you install it is you, it's a binary, and it's a file processor. It takes files in a directory and will then process them all together, figure out what things need to happen, the order. It'll compare that against the state that it maintains, which is outside of whatever your cloud you're going to, and then give you the difference of, of actions that it needs to be able to go out and do things. Um, I create, and I, I use a Terraform provider uh, for Azure. Um, I'm using, I think it's version 3.44 now, um, but HashiCorp has a Azure RM resource manager uh, provider I can go out and create. I create that provider, and then I add whatever I'm going to be working with it. For variables, I've got the uh, syntax where I've got a prefix. I can specify defaults. Um, I've got uh, default values where I can have different kinds of things, list values, binaries, numbers, strings. Um, and I create resources. And similar to how BICEP allows me to describe just the, the required parameters, I can go out and I can do that as well. Um, to go out and run Terraform, I run a Terraform init which initializes and downloads any modules, any external things I need. It downloads the providers, puts them into my folder in my directory where I've got things. I run a plan, which then goes out and says, what do I need to do to, be, to deploy this infrastructure? I've got an apply, which actually does the creation of it, and I've got a destroy. And I want to get a t-shirt that says, still destroying, still destroying, still destroying, because Terraform's awesome that way. It's out there, and it's like, oh, I want to be. I was watching this keynote this morning, I'm thinking, yeah, still destroying, still destroying. Ah! Uh, anyway, um, to show you what this looks like, um, I would create a folder, and we'll call this TF. And inside my Terraform, I'm going to create a file called main.tf. And I'm going to create a very simple Terraform uh, infrastructure, which is going to map similar to what we did before. I would do my TF, and I'm going to use my provider, which has got the things I need. Um, I've got a data, which is referring to existing things inside of, ter inside of Azure, um, like existing resources, like a key vault, or maybe a storage account, or a resource group. Um, I would re reference them that way. And then I can go and I can have my variables. My variables, I can go out and say, here's my variable name, app name. And I would go through and I would create this stuff. Uh, when I've got, uh, we're in ARM and in BICEP, I have the variable section. In Terraform, I use locals. And so I have a locals section. And in there, that's where I would create my prefix and my naming standard. And then I can use those throughout. And that's what, the way that I've gone through and have done that. Um, to show you what this looks like when it's kind of done, because. I want you to be able to see it. Uh, did I create it? I didn't, not in this one. What it looks like is this. And this has the resource group name. It's got the resources. I'm creating a resource group where I'm specifying the name, location. Um, when I create a resource, I'm putting in the values for the different pieces. Uh, what I would do is I would take this and come back over here to this one. 
And what I could do is then I could take this, do a save everything, go to the period, and I go CD uh, infra slash Terraform, and inside of this now go Terraform init, which initializes, goes out, downloads the providers, brings in everything it would need to be able to do this deployment, and then I can run Terraform plan and apply. I can just do Terraform, because in Terraform, a lot of people talk about wanting to know what if. If I do this deployment, what's going to change? And so the plan allows me to go out and create that, and I can save that plan, and then I can go out and apply that plan. Or I could short, short circuit and just do a Terraform apply, which is going to do the plan first, and then use the output of that to uh, actually create the infrastructure. So again, it's got variables, so my app name would be NDC23. I would put in the environment name be Terraform. And now this is going to go ahead and it's going to create a number of different files here that it's using to, um, to work with this. So on the local machine, it downloaded the providers in the Terraform folder. And if I looked at that, it's a binary file. I would see there's a state file and a lock file that gets created. Um, the Terraform state file is where it knows what this would look like. And when, if I do another change to the infrastructure and I run this, it'd say, oh, nothing's changed. Or if I did added another whatever, it would say, oh, this is different. So if I go here and I say yes, go out and create this. Type in yes. Oh yes, go out and do this. It's gonna take the plan that it created, which has got the green pluses, and it's gonna go out and create those parts of it inside of Azure for me now. One of the things I need to be sure to do is have a git ignore to not check those things into the, your, your source code, obviously. Um, but the Terraform state file has interesting things in there, like sensitive data, passwords, in plain text, which is sort of scary. Should we be afraid? Maybe, I don't know. But the idea is that um, you just need to know what that is and to be aware of it so that you can uh, be careful that uh, we don't um, expose it. Pulumi is another one. It's a, uh, a tool, I don't have time to show it, but the Pulumi is a, I can use C Sharp, I can use Ruby, I can use other JavaScript to go out and create infrastructure and it uses Terraform under the covers to create that. Um, the use case for this might be I've got a product and I'm deploying something that's got some cloud stuff that gets provisioned. It's not really source code that I'm managing, but rather some, you know, like customer information or, or other kinds of data. Ansible is a third, is a fourth tool that, um, that we could look at. Um, to compare these, there's a lot of things that you look at. You know, what is the language that you're learning? What does the tooling look like? What makes the most sense? Do I have preview of changes? Do I have to worry about state management and things like that? Questions about this? So, ARM is great, but it is verbose. Bicep, I find to be uh, my favorite uh, infrastructure is code. Number one, it's, it's always up to date. I never have to worry about the state information, um, but it does have the limitation of being Azure only. And so if I'm working for some place that has something besides Azure, I'll use Terraform. Um, Terraform is a great tool. There's a lot of support. It's, it's getting more and more mature all the time. Um, I'll, use it, I'll use Terraform for Azure too, if, if they're also using Terraform for other things. Or I might say use Bicep for ARM and use Terraform for the other stuff. Depends on what teams and the people, what they need to do. Um, Pulumi, I like, but I really haven't had a, a real project that's like a paying project, a real consulting thing to get into it beyond uh, just scratching the surface with it. Ansible has also been there for a long time. I asked Chat GPT which is better. I thought that would be my summary, but it really is, you know, hey, you know, both these have their strengths and weaknesses, see? It, it depends. <laughs> my, own, my own take on this is it doesn't matter which one you, it, it does matter, but use something. What matters more than the choice of what you use is that you are using something for infrastructure as code because that allows you to create something that's repeatable, 
manageable. You can go back and see how did we get to where we are. And it turns around and gives us you know, the opportunity to really expand on that and enforce things like naming standards, tagging standards. These things are important. And making, it, making software that we can own and live with um, through the life, lifespan of things. Any other questions? Gosh, yes. Do I say? Can you utilize it with Visual Studio? Yes. Yes, you can use Visual Studio. Does not, though, have like a bicep templates in it. But I'd like to see them invest more in the Visual Studio experience. Just personally, as a Visual Studio developer evangelist, I really like Visual Studio. But VS Code is also nice. And a lot of times, I use different tools for the job. Um, yes. There were. I have an extension installed from Microsoft for Bicep, and that gives me the, the bulk of almost everything that I do. I did have a Linux plan which was not available in the templates that Microsoft had, and so I created my own code snippets inside of Visual Studio, or VS Code, and um, I used that syntax to get exactly what I wanted. Um, what I found was that the um, GitHub Copilot, when I was playing with, with that earlier this week, was almost giving me the same suggestions, but it was just a little bit off and it was also unpredictable as to how it was going to do things. I just haven't had a time to play with that yet enough. Good question. Right. Right. There, there is within ARM. When I do the deployment, it is either additive or it is. And if you do the one that's exactly, and I've moved stuff out of that template, it will de delete that from your resource groups. Um, so there is a way to, to do something similar, but your idea of being able to go out and say, destroy this, and having it, here's my state, this is what's going to get destroyed, I kind of like that too. Yeah. Yep. All right. Yes. I, so uh, this is a great question is strategies on how do I manage the infrastructure as code. I tend to put it into a separate folder within the given application repo, but it depends on the size of the team and who's managing it. Um, if you've got an infrastructure team that is doing most of the deployments, put it in something they have access to, and it comes down to uh, separation of responsibilities. Good question, yes. Mm -hmm. So ARM isn't going anywhere. It's not f fading out. It's not like we're going to stop using ARM. Bicep is a transpiler that makes it easier to work with ARM. And I, I don't see any reason to start with raw working with ARM in the editors because it is cumbersome. Uh, and I think the tooling has, has come a long way for working with Bicep and with Terraform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, using Docker without Kubernetes, that's a whole containerization. Let's have that conversation later. In the interest of, yeah. All right. 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 Yeah. So I, I think ARM is ARM is there because it's storing it in that format, but. The bicep makes it easier to work with it, and that's, that's the direction that's trying to go with that. All right, in the interest of time, I want to thank everyone. Um, if you have other questions, I think we're, I think we're out of time. Am, am I not wrong? <laughs>